and um, it's something that that we think should be should be looked into and addressed. And we're happy to take any questions now. Okay, uh, thank you all for your presentations and for uh, and for coming. So why don't we uh, address any questions specifically about this, and then we'll go on to our broader uh, discussion about uh, perceptions. So we'll start, with Bob. Uh, so first off, as a uh, uh, Virginia interested in public health and tobacco control, I want to tell everybody how proud we are of the work of the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth. I mean, not only are, have they been doing a program like you saw it today, but they support a lot of school-based prevention programs, a really wide diversity of things across a lot of age groups, and even in their infinite wisdom, they support research uh, yeah. in the form of the uh, of Virginia Youth Tobacco Project, so we're very proud of, the, of their work. Uh, I have a question that confuses me a little bit about the data. I'm not sure which of you would answer, maybe Judy. The, you have a, a large percentage of respondents saying that these, they think that these products are candy, mint, or gum, but, but, but really only 20% will try them. I, mean, I just sort of guess I would be wondering why, if, it, if they really were convinced that they were candy, mint, or gum, if they were offered a lifesaver or something like that. I mean, why would only 20% want to try one if, in fact, that's what they, if they thought they were candy, mint, or gum? Do you have any explanation for why people would, in effect, turn down a candy product? Well, um, in addition to them wanting to try it, it's not necessarily that they'd be willing to try it, but maybe, like, they would be willing to buy it. Because, um, you know, you've seen lots of candy, mints, or gums. If I have a new candy on the market, I'm not necessarily going to try it, even though it might be attractive. But just knowing that it's not as harmful as, or thinking that it's not as harmful as a traditional tobacco product is something that's extremely dangerous. So, yeah. so just to clarify, so they, they weren't really, the question wasn't worded in such a way that if you were offered a free sample, <laughs> yeah, you, it, you didn't word it that way. I mean, it was worded in such a way that it could imply purchasing or... Yeah, it was just worded, would you be willing to try this product based on the packaging alone or based on the flavors alone? Yeah, and, and I think the saturation of the candy, gum, and mint market, you know, makes them a little less inclined to try everything that's new out there. So uh, so you're, you're looking at if 39% of them thought the packaging was candy, mint, or gum, over half of them uh, would have tried it. So, so it is a large percentage of those who thought it was candy. Okay, uh, continue around. Ellen? Have you guys looked to see whether, this is going to be similar to my question um, from the last presentation, have you looked to see whether those free responses of, yes, this is candy, mint, gum, and maybe even coffee, does that predict their likelihood to try it? Um, no, we have not looked at that yet. It, it, might be a, it might be a good idea to take a look because you're, um, from what you guys are talking about, you're sort of inferring that, but you can actually look at that within your data. Um, the other thing I'd want, I, I just wanted to comment on is, first, a great job with the presentation. It was really interesting. The data are fascinating. It is still a scientific study. <laughs> it happens to be a convenient sample, so it has limits, but this study is incredibly timely. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, it may also be publishable if that's something you guys are interested in. Uh, I, I would at least consider doing that. Um, but, but I would dig in the data a little bit more, too, to see whether your, your inference about the, this candy gum or mints really does make a difference to whether they would try it. Appreciate that, and I'm sure now we will look into publishing it. <laughs> uh, Dan, yeah, I had uh, two quick questions, uh, and I thank the presenters for their contribution here. Uh, I, maybe I missed it. Uh, are there uh, data here that would and allow us to uh, on the willingness to try question? Uh, I, I'm wondering, were there was there a difference in the willingness to try between smoking? youth and the non-smoking youth, which is the data we saw. And I guess my second question is, uh, I, I think at least one of these products wasn't available on the market, I don't believe, in, in your region. So I guess the youth would have only seen this, the image. Uh, I wonder if there are any differences in the uh, willingness to try and other numbers for the products that were actually on the market and potentially seen by these individuals versus just seeing the uh, image. Um, yeah, the, the percentage of youth smokers versus non-smokers, uh, I only gave that number verbally. So the 26% here, which is the New Mexico number, is of all youth willingness to try. And then the number that is of only non-tobacco-using youth, it's actually 23%. Similarly, the Virginia one is 23% overall versus 21% for only non-tobacco-using youth. Uh, is that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, for your second question, um, we did we see a difference between Stonewall and and the, the Camel products? Um, I'm looking at uh, one of our, our team members in the audience. Uh, I, I I think just from a uh, personal impression, uh, the Camel Orbs was a little bit more uh, because it's brand new. I think it's a little it's designed to be a little bit more appealing. So even if familiarity with Stonewall may have been uh, more than familiarity with the new Camel products, the new Camel products are still a little more uh, designed, a little bit more attractive. So so that that may have offset that potential difference. If I can do a quick follow up. So the, the percentage of uh, non-smokers we, we see and then the total youth, is the difference between those numbers, the number of smokers? So is, it was only a few percent of smokers, like 3% uh, in general. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Uh, do you know what percentage? Uh, Maybe perhaps if you want to come to the microphone, please. Joyce, this, this is Mile, also from Rescues, helping us. Okay, and just uh, identify yourself. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maya Jakaria from Rescue Social Change Group. I help with the Meltdown campaign. Um, so to, to address your question, the number of teams who said they would try Camel overall and the number of teams who currently do not use tobacco products, um, it, it's from a different sample size. So for the teams who currently do not use tobacco products, it was a smaller sample size than the overall, um, than the overall um, under 18 sample. Do, do we have the percentage of current tobacco users who would try? No, we didn't look at that. Okay. But we can. But we will. <laughs> Shoot you an email. Okay, um, Neil? Um, a couple of things I just didn't, I didn't fully understand. 40% thought it was candy, mints, or gum. Did the other 60% think it was tobacco? Uh, we, have, um, we have the full... So the way that it was... Um, Analyze is that it was it was open ended, so we had to code them. Um, well, we coded it based on candy, mints, or gum, medicine, um, tobacco, and other. Meaning that you know it was food or a beverage for um, for the packages. Um, for the flavors, how we coded it was um, based on uh, if they believe it was alcoholic beverage, a non alcoholic beverage, candy, mints, or gum, um, food, medicine, other, and tobacco. So what percentage thought it was tobacco? I'm sorry, for which one? For um, these products, what percentage of, of the respondents thought that this was tobacco? It's, it's different for each. What, what would you say is the, the range that, that we had? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I'd have to look at the numbers, but I would say anywhere between, you know, 20 to 30. Okay. So, yep. so we still had, besides this 39%, we still had a large chunk that thought it was something else. Um, I know Stonewall got a lot of medicine responses. A lot of people <laughs> thought that that might be like, um, uh, some people even said birth control pills that they thought Stonewall was. So, <laughs> so there, there was a lot of different responses. It doesn't mean uh, the whole remaining was, uh, was tobacco responses. And, and a follow up on that, it, I'd like to know, of the people who recognize this as tobacco, how many would be interested in trying it? And that's a good cross tab for us to do. I, I noticed that uh, Tipsack is full of suggestions for everybody um, <laughs> today. Um, I, I do think it might be valuable, going back to Neil's um, question about the, the, the question of how many perceive these products as tobacco products, that would probably be useful information uh, I think for us and okay. for others in, in general, Dorothy. Yeah, I, actually when looking at the information that was submitted to um, the FDA, it looks like for Stonewall, uh, among those who are under 18, it looks like 54% consider it a tobacco product. For, um, for ORDS, it was 56%. Okay. So th those are among people that are under the, uh, in the In the very original report? And that the was very, early, er okay. yeah, the very. Yeah. Okay, other, yeah, Tom. Um, I want to echo Dr. Peter's enthusiasm for the presentation and the data, and I, I do think they should be published. I'd, I'd also echo Dr. Ball, as a, as a Virginian, I'd echo Dr. Ballster's pride, though that's tempered with the fact that we are the home of Altria. Um, I, uh, I guess I wish you had been here yesterday uh, when in the public comments we heard that it was the public health uh, researchers juxtaposition of these products with candy that leads to the perception that they are candy-like. 
what I'm hearing from you today is that you presented an open-ended questionnaire and that um, there was no prior association on your part of these products with candy. Am I hearing that accurately? Yeah, that's definitely accurate. And I just want to also mention that in the survey itself with the pictures, we did not blot out any of the actual logo. We had camel there for everybody to see. So we didn't, it was not um, closed-ended. We said anything that you could possibly think it was. And a lot of people responded with candy. And it's hard for me to tell in the, in the, the picture of the survey how legible the, the products were. So could you see the word tobacco and um, read the word tobacco? Yeah, on the Stonewall products, you could actually read the word tobacco and you could read spit-free. Um, for the other products, Snooze, it says camel, mellow, spit-free tobacco. Those are all very visible. It's a bit easier to see when you have it like this big in person. So. And in the picture where I think I, I, I may have interpreted this incorrectly, it, it looked like in a picture that um, these surveys were filled out in what could have been a group setting. Is, is that correct? Um, yes, that was possible, but most of the people I talked to did it one-on-one -on -one just because it was easier, and after filling out the survey, it was really great for them to talk and actually educate them, but some were filled out in a group setting. So in that education, mm -hmm. and I'm not asking this in a critical way, I'm asking it because I can see what uh, some of the, how, how it could be criticized. Um, is it possible that folks you educated uh, uh, spoke with folks who then filled out the survey? Um, I guess that is certainly possible, but we did make it a point to make sure that we educated them afterwards. So I would say we did as much as we could to minimize that. So help me understand a little bit about the way the survey was filled out. You, mm -hmm. you said you did some 200 or something. Yes. How, how did you approach people? Was it over the course of many hours? Mm -hmm. Just give me a quick view. Of yeah, that. Um, personally, I split it up into a couple of different what we like to consider projects, which are 30 surveys at a time. Um, for a minimum, but I went out into my community. I've done things in the park. I've been to Walmart, to say the least. Um, I've talked, most of it was with people in my school just during lunch. So I approached them one-on-one, -on -one and I didn't mention anything about the tobacco products. I just mentioned that this was a survey we were doing, and if they could answer the questions, I didn't impose any of my own opinions. And I had them fill out the survey. If they had questions, sometimes they asked us, like, for clarification on the product, and it was just pretty much... I was just there to administer the survey. I didn't really provide them with anything extra. And then after filling out the survey, that was where the education component came in, and we told them exactly what the gold meltdown was and the dangers of these tobacco products. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, John? The question for the adult leadership of the organization, do you think these products taste like candy? Sure. It's all about them. Uh, to the microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, the, um, all of the snooze, I think, is fantastic, um, quite delicious, actually. The, uh, some of the, the sticks are, are horrible. And this is my personal opinion. Um, the strips, which we didn't uh, test, I think are, are um, probably the most dangerous because they dissolve in about the 20 seconds and taste and look just like a, the, the breast strips. Um, the orbs, the mints are pretty good. They taste like candy. The mellows are, are not so good. <laughs> and the stone walls, uh, the, the naturals um, equally as gross, but the, um, the wintergreen um, and the java are pretty good. So I would say some of them, yes, do taste like candy. But again, that's my, my palate, um, which has been burned on coffee way too many times. So. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for that, um, Ellen. <laughs> we do not all try the tobacco products. Just, we have a guinea pig. I, I had a couple other sort of d devil's advocate questions for your study, if you don't mind. Um, you, you mentioned, for example, that when you were collecting data that you sometimes collected in your own school. Do the kids in your school know that you work with an anti-tobacco group? Um, initially they didn't, but as I progressed my youth advocacy work, inevitably they have heard. But hopefully that didn't, um, that didn't skew the data too much. Only a portion of it was collected at school, so we did do some other more random sampling. But it, it suggests that you may want to do analyses with and without um, your school, mm -hmm. uh, simply because people may be aware of, of your positioning, and they may, even though you didn't mention tobacco, yeah. that may come to mind right yeah, away for them. Yeah, we can definitely them. look into that. Yeah. The, um, the other question I had is... Um, 
and again, this is just a devil's advocate question. I think the study is terrific, but it, it's things that you would deal with if you if you end up wanting to publish. Um, and I'm curious about this. So adolescents are great. I've had one before. They're wonderful people. They occasionally give responses that are, um, uh, I don't know, how shall I phrase this? Contrary to <laughs> perhaps what they even believe. What did they say for Tic Tacs about what it was? Did any of them say tobacco? Did anyone say anything other than candy mints? I guess they're not a gum, but... Well, I mean, I can't speak for the entire 8,000, 14,000 samples, but personally with my friends, pretty much everybody knew that it was a Tic Tac and they were straightforward with that. So I didn't really have anybody trying to pull my leg or anything. It would be good to look in the data. Your friends might all be going to Princeton. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, well, Miles might, might know. There, there was a very small percentage that actually was that Tic Tac was, was tobacco. I think about 1 or 2 percent. I can't remember. Um, but um, and, and thank you for um, somebody who brought the report, but we actually have an updated report that we'll make available soon. Okay. Yeah, and, and one more comment on the um, the impression of, of the youth. The way all of these programs work, they actually work through existing clubs, so we don't establish anti-tobacco clubs. Judy's a rock star who has TV interviews and all of that, so uh, her friends uh, may, may have known, but most of these youth are known as a cheerleader or a DECA club member, a key club member at FBLA, because that's where they get their, their little mini grant to do this work. So most likely they're known as a club member before they're known as any kind of anti-tobacco advocate, for, for the most part, um, except for when they get news articles and things. <coughs> Let me check on the phone and see if there are any uh, questions. Mark, I have a question. OK, uh, John? Yeah, uh, Dr. Heck reminded me that I brought this along. This is something I picked up at my local Walmart. And uh, anyone want to say, well, this tastes like candy or not? What is it? Nicorette? It's a Nicorette gum package with the labels fruit chill and coated for bold flavor. I don't know what it tastes like, but it sure doesn't look like candy from here. It looks like to make a chiclet. And I assure you, this product tastes better than any of the products you listed up there as tobacco products. Now, I've, I've tasted all of the ones you have up there, both old and new versions. This tastes far, far better. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> um, Hello, John. Okay, other, uh, is that comment from the phone? Is that a voice? This is a voice. This is Mark Clanton. Go can ahead, you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can. Go ahead. Okay. My question, uh, again, first the compliments to the study uh, and the data on the candy and for gum, but I'm particularly drawn to uh, the respondents who look at this as medication or medicine. Um, I'm curious, were there any additional questions that helped you understand for those who thought it was medicine, if they thought uh, or could respond that it was a stimulant medication versus some other kind of medication? Um, no, th th there wasn't any kind of follow-up. And unfortunately, the uh, because of the, the way the so survey is administered by youth, um, you know, it's a short survey, and we, we just take what, what adults wrote down on there. And let me ask a question. Yeah, to take a chance, and, and we also will sort of ask unfair questions. But the reason why I ask that is when uh, dextromethorphan, which is a cough suppressant in various cough medications, was put on the market, uh, neither public health nor medicine or anybody else associated with a, a stimulant medication, which now has to be protected in sales because you, some of you do use it as a stimulant. So I, I was very curious to know, maybe in future surveys, you could drill down a bit and understand whether they, for those who identify it as medicine, if in fact uh, they perceive that there's any stimulant effect from it, because it could end up being used that way, certainly uh, in, a, in a larger uh, market. Yeah, uh, we, we agree, and we can look into some sort of a kind of follow-up questionnaire that, that we can do with people based on their answers. Actually, uh, my question was, what follow-up are you planning? In other words, is this going to be an ongoing project and, and survey looking at what happens over time? Is this a one-time shot of where are we going next? Um, each of the, the, the way that Wide Street works, uh, they look at campaigns on an annual basis, sometimes pick one or two campaigns that they work on. So it has to do with 
with what the youth leaders are interested in working on and what the what the demand is. For example, when the FDA put out the call for uh, public comment on the warning labels, um, the youth jumped on it and created a, a, a campaign immediately to do something. So if the FDA similarly said, we, we need data on this, uh, we, we would present it to the youth leaders and, and, and they would respond. But as of now, there isn't another dissolvable study going on in any of the states. Okay, any other uh, questions for our uh, presenters? So I'll add a uh, historical note. I actually grew up in Virginia, Newport News, and somewhere deep in the last century, my elementary school class made a trip to the Philip Morris factory in Richmond. So it um, sounds like uh, perhaps things have changed for uh, Virginia youth. I actually still do remember the, the factory because it was very impressive to sort of see this production line of uh, machines with thousands of uh, packages uh, rolling off. I'm not going to reveal what year that was, but <laughs> you can all take your guesses um, as to when that was. But thank you very much for your thank presentations. You. Good luck at uh, Princeton. So uh, I think uh, what, what we need to do now, I think, is uh, sort of